stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow. sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him
Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for the day, Lord. God, I just pray that um, this time of worship was, God, not only um, pleasing to you and your ears, but it was a blessing, God. And um, Father, I just pray that our, our whole hearts were in it. God, and it just wasn't to let our voices be heard or, um, God, just to uh, appear to be worshiping on the outward. But God, I pray that it came from the heart. Father, I, I thank you for this church. I thank you for um, the word that you bring to us every week. So, Father, I pray that as we prepare to hear it, God, I just pray that you would um, bless Pastor Charlie. Lord, speak through him. God, allow him to speak boldly with clarity. And, Lord, allow our hearts to be opened and softened to receive from you, God. And it's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. Why don't you say good morning to one another? All right. It is always uh, a blessing to hear people talking, as you guys should be in church, not while the service is going on, but in fellowship time. Um, well, we don't really have many new announcements, so um, anything that's going on, you can look in the bulletin and see it. But what is new this week is we do have the Mother's Prayer Group on starting up on, is it Wednesday? nine o'clock at Jenna's house. And if you want more information on that, it's, there's some more at the info table. You can go there, but um, obviously nice. The women are gathering and praying, which is a good thing. Um, next, though, um, as you guys know, we have a school here, and it has been phenomenal to see what God has done in the school. And sometimes, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind, but it is happening. And a lot of people serve there, and our heart at the school it is more than just the idea of academics, it's really discipleship and character building and, and to see the kids who do come here, how their attitudes will change. There's a desire for them to be here. They want to be at school. There's a lot of kids that they, we have call off. They, they just like freak out. Usually some of them will come here anyways and just hang out for the day. But um, it's a blessing to see. But we, have a, we had a basketball team starting up last year. But uh, this last week was actually our first home game for the boys basketball team. So we got to see our basketball team play in, in the gymnasium over there or in the gym. And there was three games. And to all of their defense, because we have a JV, um, a fifth grade boys team. It's like fifth grade and there's two seventh graders. And then we have the eighth and ninth grade team, which we call our varsity team. And then we have a varsity girls team, which is eighth grade girls. But we played Cathedral, which is another Christian school in town. And they, play, they sent their varsity team against our boy team, which was three seniors, a junior, and some other older kids. So 
a high school team had to play against our junior high team. And then they had their junior high team play against our fifth grade team. <laughs> and, and we got some uh, uh, photos we're going to show you here in a second. But then, of course, the girls team, they had to play against the varsity team. And my daughter, I mean, she's in seventh grade. Um, there was a senior girl. Like, I mean, she was, I mean, she's 18 years old. And she's just pushing people around. <laughs> my daughter, she, she is like me. She's like a bulldog. So when she, she gets mad, she gets, like, she was mad. <laughs> she, like, saw what she's doing because one of her friends just got pushed over. Glasses knocked off her face and everything. And Rachel saw, I mean, she just got mad, got right in front of that girl and pushed her, <laughs> pushed her right out of bounds, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> But uh, they, the younger boys team um, lost. I don't say of course, but they're playing against kids older than them. And then the girls team lost again, kids older than them. But the varsity boys team, this was the best part, is they're outside the gym talking and they're like, they only got one good player. We're going to crush them. We beat them 54 to 44. <laughs> and, and we took it to them. I mean, we got some photos of that um, um, the, of those games. It was really special to see them all and just how the evolution of the school is taking place. We actually have a, a basketball team here. So uh, you ready, Trevor, to show that? They've really improved. Um, last year, we played uh, a tournament. Um, it's down by um, Deer Grove, Tampa, Illinois. I know you probably have no idea where that's at, unless you know it's the birthplace of Ronald Reagan. It's actually where I was born and raised. I was born in Sterling Rock Falls, down by Tampa Grove. Um, but there's this, this uh, tournament they do, and they get kids, um, pretty good teams. So like Rochelle's team played last year, they got destroyed. I mean, there's some pretty good basketball teams. Last year, we, we played three games. Our team, boys team did. We lost by at least 30 points every game. There was eight teams we played yesterday. The boys took third place. They won the consolation bracket. They lost the first game and then won out. And they won by pretty de decisively. And to see how well these boys have come along and play, it's pretty cool to see. And um, they're having a good time, learning a lot of things. The girls' tournaments today, so... We'll see how they do. But um, it's just such a blessing to be part of these, these kids' lives in our school and just to see that they get to do fun things, but in an environment that is a Christian environment. So I bring this up because church, this school here is a ministry of the church. So in our actual bylaws, it's written as that. So a lot of places will separate the church and the school and the separate finances, not here. So the church here funds the school. Because you see, we, we don't have enough money, or we don't charge enough for tuition, so we can um, pay all the staff we need, so the church actually supports them. And we see that our ministry really is kids. We think kids are very important, and we see what's going on in the culture and the world, and we think kids should be protected, and they should be discipled. And so that's what we do, what we do here. Um, so please know that, and pray for us. Um, like I said, we don't have enough money to hire a bunch of people, so we have people from the church come during the week to volunteer, and we always have needs for lunchtime. So there's a sign-up sheet out by the school. If you ever have a day off and you want to come and serve for an hour, an uh, hour and a half, to just for lunchtime, see the kids, and just help keep crowd control, we, we will love your help. There's ways you can help the school. 
is by doing that. So, um, yeah, just keep us in prayer. And then one more thing I just found out. It was actually uh, Izzy's birthday today. Is that right? Nine, nine years old. Is that? He's right over there. All right. So we want to sing happy birthday to Izzy. She's turning all red over there. So we know. Is that nine? Are you right? Okay, nine years old. She's like practically a grown-up. Almost two whole hands, right? All right, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Izzy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Izzy. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and for the truth and for what you're doing. Lord, there is a lot of negatives we could go to. But Lord, there is a lot of positives and that you're still on the throne and that you're still working and you're working in the hearts and lives of kids and adults alike. Lord, I believe that uh, you still have work for us to do. And so Lord, may our hearts, our minds be sensitive to your voice, your leading, your calling. May you bless each one of us, Lord. And even as we study your word, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in Hebrews chapter 13, so go ahead and turn there. We're talking about foundations. And as the writer of Hebrews is closing out the book, he's listing things as Christians we need to remember, we need to hold on to, we need to make sure are part of our lives. Now, <clears throat> there's a saying that says, you shouldn't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. And I understand the good nature to that statement, that like if you're living a type of Christianity that is not at all relatable to people outside the church, it's almost a pointless type of Christianity. And I'm not trying to become the world. I'm saying don't become weird. And there are those Christians who act a certain way in the church where it, or they act a certain way outside. that You can't really reach people because you're not human. You don't act like normal, almost like a, a cult type of thing. I mean, Jesus called us as the church to be in the world, just not of the world, and that our character and our witness would not be so much as us acting weird or acting like praise Jesus and all the Christian, the Christianese language that we might say, but that our character would be different, that there would be something special about how we live, even though we might look like everyone else, even though we might, from the outward appearance, see no difference, but our inward character would be something different. That's what he's calling us to do. You see, Jesus wanted his disciples, including you, to be a witness, a testimony to him. And so with that being said, I also think the pendulum can swing to the other side where we begin to focus on the wrong things as Christians, that quickly our mind begins to shift to things of this world. So the same things that the world would be after we're seeking after. Well, you see, Paul tells us that we're to set our mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. Paul would say that we do not look for things which are seen, we look for the things which are not seen, because the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. And even Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount says, do not store your treasures on earth, because it's going to go away. They're not permanent. He even says, wherever your treasure is, there's where your heart is. And so if your treasure is something you can see on earth, if that's your treasure, just remember that's where your heart is, and it's going to be taken from you one day. Because the things that we see are not eternal. Jesus goes on to say that you cannot serve two masters. You will love one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's impossible. He goes and says that if your eye is good... now. When he says eye, he's not talking about your eyeball. <laughs> he's talking about your eye as your focus, your vision of life. If your eye is set on the right thing, he says your whole body's full of light. There will be something different to your character. There'll be something different to your mind, your life. It will shine. He says, but if your eye is bad, the whole body will be darkness. And that's clearly what happens when we begin to set our mind on the things of this world, when we set our mind on treasures on earth. Begins to, it begins to corrode away, and we begin to be full of darkness. It might sound weird to say it like that, but it's true. As we see people who seek after pleasure, 
are consumed by pleasure. Well, today, as we talk about these foundations, we're going to see that our heart and our mind is something of a different order. We're of a different mindset. And so we'll start off with verse 7 that says, Remember those who rule over you. The idea is a shepherd, you pastor you, who's spoken the word of God to you. It says, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Now, we live in an age of information. And it's so easy to get caught in a scam. It really is. Because when you listen to someone talk, they sound right. I remember, I like to listen to the other side of arguments because I like to make sure that I'm not deceived. And so I'll give a good ear to reasons why someone would believe what they believe. And I remember listening to an atheist once share the reasons why evolution is true. And he was a scientist, and he was making his point. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, that is very convincing. That is very good information. What if I'm being wronged? And then you heard someone rebut it, or someone from the other side, or the truth. And you're like, oh boy, that guy's a fool. He has no idea what he's talking about. You see, guys, if you're only hearing part of information, it may sound very true, but you have to hear the whole thing, the whole story. And that's the problem with the internet and information and YouTube. We don't have the wherewithal to want to hear the other side. It's like this. If I said all you need to do to drive a, a, a car, what you need to drive a car is you need gasoline. Now, that's true, but is that the whole truth? No, you actually need lots of things. Because you need oil and you need spark plugs and coolant and a, um, an alternator and an oil pump, uh, 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 airflow, you need a fuel pump, and it just goes on and on. You see, you do need gas, but there's a whole other list of things you need. And that's how things can go and how we can easily be tricked. And the same thing happens in Christianity and churches. And there's a lot of Christians, a lot of pastors that, that will say true things. You say, well, I was there and said it was true. It is true that you need gasoline. But there's a lot more involved to the truth than just to say part of it. Because you see, that's how people can be tricked or deceived. So how can you know who is good and who is bad? Well, it's interesting that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it actually talks about um, how to know if someone is qualified for the ministry of being a head pastor. As Paul gives the list, there are all things that you would say, okay. But then he says, but this is the proof. He says, look at the pastor's children. The pastor's children will tell you the story if he is qualified or not. And the, the is, is are the children respectful and do they listen to authority? If your children, as a, if, he, if the pastor has children that are not respectful and they're not listening to the authority, that tells you that there's a problem in that pastor's home. That's how it works. Because you see, being a pastor is not something you come up on stage and talk. It's a lifestyle. And it's so easy to say the right things or that you're doing the right things. But the character or the conduct of the pastor should be, is, is revealed in the family. And how the family is at home and how the family act around tells you everything you need to know about that pastor. That is why he points to it, says, look at the conduct. Look at the behavior of the family because that tells you how he treats them. You see, this is a big mistake that a lot of pastors made. I know this because... <laughs> Even my own pastor, when you have two kids that turn out to be atheists, there's a problem. One's agnostic, so technically not atheist. One's an atheist, one's an agnostic. But what is the problem? Kids don't want to be told what to do. They want to see it. Because believe it or not, your actions in your home speak much louder than your words do. And you can be telling your kids all the right things. But if what they observe is the opposite, the words mean nothing. And how we act at our home, how you communicate with your kids and what they see you doing, they see what kind of behavior is dad up. What is his life like? 
and it reflects in how they behave with others. It's that simple. It may even be convicting, but it's true. And that is why it's said, consider, consider the conduct, consider the behavior of the pastor so you can show you what kind of man he is. And, and that might be hard to, to see today, especially because we don't get to go into the lives of pastors much. That's why sometimes you might say, you know, I want to test them. Go talk to the kids. Go corner Rachel one time. Go corner Charlie. Ask them to do something for you. See what they say. Because they'll tell you. They'll tell you what's going on in their heart and mind. You see, guys, the reality, beha- the reality about the truth is there's just so many different thoughts and ideas and doctrines out there. And a lot of times they're just pointless. They sound good, but they're worthless. Like just take something like the promise ring or the WWJD bracelet. And we look at it like, oh, if you just make this promise and wear this ring, you know, that's going to save you from marriage. You know, and then, or the WWJD bracelet, you know, just wear this bracelet. So when you're tempted, you can look at that and say, what would Jesus do? And then I will not tempt you anymore. It's pointless. There's no power in that. Because a person who is being tempted could care less about a dumb ring or a bracelet. What is going to give you the power to overcome these kind of things is the work of God in your life. It's feeding the Holy Spirit in your life. And these kind of things, you know, we, we go and we get these little simple applications. Like, oh yeah, I could do that. I could buy that bracelet. That bracelet isn't going to help you. <laughs> You're going to take it off and chuck it. Because you want to sin, you want to sin. You say, well, how do I overcome your sins? Well, it's like, well, go to what the Bible's actually teaching not to the gimmicks of men. And you hear people get so caught up even in theology. And you're sitting back listening to these arguments and it's like, what are you doing for the Lord right now? Because all I hear is like very, you know, ignorant men who think they're something trying to debate over Greek words or origins. It's pointless. The word of God is alive and powerful and it works in our lives. And when we begin to apply it, we see fruit. You see... If I am preaching a message that is a working message, it should be worked in my, out in my life. If I am pre- preaching a message that has no substance or no fruit out of my life, it's a bad message. Because as it always goes, <laughs> I do love telling this story, is when this guy at the gym, not in shape, was trying to tell me how to build muscle. And when I heard what he was saying, which was not right information, but he was sure was convinced of it. I said, if I want to look like you, I will do that. <laughs> and there is a reality in that, really, even from a biblical standpoint. Because it's like, if I'm preaching a message and you look, it's like, well, Charlie's life, what good is it? His kids are unruly and just terrible kids. What's the point? That's what you should say. Because if the message is not consistent, it's a, it's, a per, it's a pointless message. And we need to take considering of that. There is a character that should be seen in the life of the preacher. And it is seen when you're around him, as you should be at times. In verse 8, he goes inside and says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's one of my life verses. It's one of the, the tattoos I have on me. Because I love this verse. It's a constant you know, the Bible doesn't need to be changed. It doesn't need to be altered. It's always the same. And that's really nice because we live in a changing world and everything changes all the time. And when some things are always changed, people change. It's interesting, as, especially as I get older, you see, I change. You know, and my, my wife has changed. Our kids are changing. I kind of wonder, like, what is constant in life? You know, always things are changing. The only thing that is consistent is Jesus Christ. And that's actually very nice to have because it's dependable. And sometimes you're going to hit those things in life that just throw a wrench in everything, and you need something that's dependable. Unfortunately, it's not people. (laughs) Because people that you need to be there, sometimes they're just not there. And then it's just you. You feel alone. We're not. Jesus is there. And he's always faithful. He's always constant. 
We put so much in, into stock into things that if we really think about it logically, it makes no sense. I was talking to a doctor once, and he said, you know, in medical school, my professor said to me, 50% of all the medical knowledge we know is wrong, and it's your job to figure out what's right and what's wrong. 50%. It's constantly changing. You know, they say, now they're saying cholesterol is actually good for you. It's like, what? Well, what, what, what do I do? What do I know? We don't know. Now, there's some things that are true. We do know they're true. But there's some things that are not true. It was just 57 years ago that we were doing lobotomies. We were literally sticking sharp objects into people's skull and scrambling their brain as a form of medicine. That was literally the science of the day, just 57 years ago. That's not that long ago. You see, guys, should we hope in that? Should we put our faith in that? Is that our ticket? I hope not, because it's changing. Well, what is not changing? God, Jesus Christ, his word. Build your life on something that's a foundation, because I tell you what, the world is changing all around us. The only thing that will not change is Jesus. It is comforting to know this, because, you know, as you go through life and seasons, seasons change, and you get to those places where you don't know what is right and what is wrong. You don't know who's with you and who's against you. You don't know what is happening, but you can trust Jesus and his word. And it's a great foundation, always. And Paul goes on, or the writer goes on to say, so don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines because it's actually good that a heart be established by what? By grace. And not with foods which have no pro- that have not profited those who have been occupied by them. Guys, by the context here and by the food, he's talking about people who, the Hebrews, who were consumed with the law. They thought their righteousness was found in the law. And so they put so much stock in that that their whole, their whole relationship with God was based in going through the rituals and eating kosher, eating the right foods. And, and, and the writer here is saying, like, that's not where your relationship with God is found. It's actually found in grace. What is grace? It's a gift. An unmerited gift, which means it's a gift that you've done nothing for. God gave it to you. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any person should boast. There's no boasting in it. There's nothing I can say that I did. It was God's grace. God saved me through my faith. And he's, he's really coming against this idea of legalism. And he's guys, guys, if you are going to have a legalistic relationship with the Lord, what is going to come of that is pride. Because pride is a very deceitful thing. Because you see, we like laws. Because we can compare ourselves with each other. We can put down people. We can point out their flaws. And pride has this weird thing that it actually blocks us out to the reality of life. That was the devil's sin. The devil thought he could overthrow God. Why? Because he's proud. The pride brings you to a place of complete ignorance of illogical things. And you see people who are lifted up in pride. They see everyone else's problem except their own. They can't look in a mirror and see, wow, look at me. But they sure can find out everyone else. They have no problem finding out the sins of everyone else. But guys, our, we have nothing to stand on in our own works. I don't go to the law and say, look how many laws I'm keeping. That's where my faith is. No, our faith is established in grace. And how much better is grace? Because it's predicated on what Jesus did, not us. Guys, laws do a very weird thing to us. Because we assume that as we keep them, then we're going to be more blessed. And what's going to happen is, is you're going to try to keep them and someone else is going to get blessed. And then you're going to be upset. Because you're going to say, well, I'm doing all these things and I didn't get that. And look at that person. They got blessed and they don't do anything like, I, like me. Because it's legalism. God's blessings are not coming 
from your works. It's grace. You see, man and, and God, we see things so differently. The Bible says that God doesn't see as a man sees because the man looks at the outward appearance. We naturally do it. And you wonder, where does it come from? You know, many people come up to me and say, you don't look like a pastor at all. And I'm like, well, what is a pastor supposed to look like? You know? And who makes those rules? What does the devil look like? Well, he's red and has horns and a pitchfork. <laughs> Why do we think that? You see, because we look at the outward. We, we, we see what we think we want to see or what is portrayed to us in, uh, in TV and media. And what is a pastor supposed to look like? Well, you know, he's supposed to be, ooh, like what? You see, God doesn't look at the outward. That's the problem. God looks at the inward. God sees the heart. And that's what throws a wrench in the whole thing. Because God knows the heart. You know, at a, look at David. David had an affair with his close friend's wife. He cheated on, he had an affair with his, his close one of his mighty men. And then, once he found out she was pregnant, he had him murdered. David was an adulterer and a murderer. The two were sins. The two things that we would say disqualifies him from ever being anything. And how did God see David? David was a man after my own heart. How is that? Because God doesn't see like we see. We're looking at the outward. We're looking at all the actions. Say, look how bad he is. God was seeing his heart. And what was David's heart like? He was broken and humbled. David sinned like the rest of us. Maybe not that bad. But he always humbled himself. In fact, when David was running from his son Absalom, there was a guy cursing him. And one of David's mighty men says, David, do you want me to go up there and kill that man? Shut him up? David says, no. Let him put me down. Because the God I serve might see and have pity on me. Humility. He did not need to defend himself. He did not need to stand on his pride. He was the king. He could have. He took, he took a humble approach. Because you see, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. You see how that works? The moment you begin to lift up yourself over others, you're actually making yourself an enemy to God. Humility is when you find yourself at peace with God. Because he doesn't want pride. Forget about your works, your sins. He, he doesn't care. He's looking at your heart. A heart of pride or a heart of humility? How do you respond? Well, this is where people get laws backwards. We think that laws are given to make us better. They're actually meant to expose you and make you guilty. Because when you read the Sermon on the Mount, you read it and you think like, oh good, I can just keep all these laws and be just like Jesus. Jesus says whoever looks with lust as someone else commits adultery. Well, you might say, well, I never, I never look. I never have any, any pure thoughts. Okay, what about if you ever say in your heart, you fool or you idiot, you're guilty of murder? See, you can't see these things, so we can lie about it all day long. Because you can see outward actions, but you, can you see the heart? No, but God does. You see, the Sermon on the Mount, it was, Jesus was pointing out to a reality to bring everyone to a humble position of brokenness and that you're a sinner. Why does God want to bring us down? Why does God want to bust us? What is the point? It's because he wants to give us grace. He wants to give us peace. And we can't find that because we're in a place of pride and self-righteousness. We think we've done nothing wrong. Thus, we don't deserve or, you know, we, we, we can stand on our, our, our own works. But I'll tell you what. When you humble yourself and just say, you know what? I'm no better. I'm a sinner too. God meets you there. You know, Jesus wants everyone to see the truth about themselves. He does. And he wants us to be broken over the reality of our own nature. 
so he can bring peace into your life. You know, I look at my life and I'm like, but I could be perfect if it wasn't for people all around me. But the problem is, is God calls us to be around people and to love. You know, I, I just know our flesh hates to be humbled. The Bible even says that our flesh is not subject to the laws of God. It can't be. And that's why when you go to a church that speaks the truth, you hate it. It hurts. And you don't like it. Because our flesh hates that. What we want, we want people to lie to us. We want to go somewhere where someone tells us how great we are. Why do we want that? Because we want to feel better about ourselves. God forbid that anyone, God's word, ever expose you and make you feel vulnerable. But you see the backwardness of it all? The person who's telling you what you want to hear is actually the person pushing you further away from God. The person who is actually going to speak the truth is bringing you humble. You hate the guy, but he's the one that's actually bringing you grace because you're finding it at humility. It's so backwards, but it's so true. What did Jesus have to say about the church of Laodicea? He's like, you guys say you're great and you're good. You don't need anything. You're rich and you're prosperous. And Jesus, you don't realize that you're naked, you're poor, you're wretched, you're miserable. You don't see the truth about yourselves. You don't know your own reality. It's like, well, why did the church think that? Because they're going to churches that were telling them what they wanted to hear. That's why. It's sad, but it's all around us. God's word is an offense to us. You don't think I know that? You don't think I understand that? <laughs> Believe me, it speaks to me too. It breaks me, humbles me. But you know what? God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. I would rather be humbled and accepted by my God than put myself in a place of having my fist to him and saying, I don't want him. Or worse, he don't want me because of my own pride. Don't get caught up with the outward. It's easy to do that because our flesh loves religion. We do. But it's not about the outward because that pride from law-keeping will blind you and you won't even realize what you're doing. You'll be just like the devil, thinking that you're going to overthrow God. And it's just, it's foolishness. Going on in verse 10, he says, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. I love this. What's he saying? You see, in Judaism and Hebrews, and the Hebrews, they had their own rituals, their own laws. They thought they were part of the in club, the religious club. And everyone wanted to be part of that club. And the writer says, you guys, they're, they're in the wrong party. That's not the popular cr cr crowd. They're not invited. So you might think they're the cool guys, that they have some special privilege with God, but actually they're not. They're the ones that aren't even invited to the party. Because you see, those who are his and those who've been born again, we have the ticket to the table of God in his house. We have that right through Jesus Christ. Be careful who we're lining ourselves up with because you know what? You might be lining yourself up with the wrong crowd. It says, verse 11, he says, for the bodies of the animals which the blood was brought, um, the blood of, whose blood was brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. And this is actually true. What was happening is they'd bring in an animal for a sacrifice it was a slaughter. The blood was offered as an atonement or covering for sin. And they took the carcass and they take it outside the camp and it would be burned out there. Now verse 13, he says, Therefore, sorry, 12, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered where? Outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But don't forget to do good and to share for which such sacrifices God is well pleased. What's going on here? It's a picture. As a lot of the Old Testament things were pictures. And what is that picture? Jesus had to go outside the system to bring people to the truth because the system was broken. 
and the system could never bring anyone to the truth. I believe that almost every denomination started out as something good. Take the Reformation with Martin Luther. 95 Thesis. He saw what was going on in the church. He saw the corruption. So he makes a stand and says, this can't be happening. What happens? They turn into a religion. Presbyterians. A Methodist. All the same thing. Well, pretty soon it's like, it's a form of religion, but men get involved and make it about rules, and kids go through, like, what's confirmation? I don't know, we just do it. Tradition. Having no reality to the nature or to the relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So God always is starting a new work. He has to, because men just get involved, and then they try to put formulas on it, and they put rules on it, and they crow the whole thing. There's people there, but it's a bunch of dead men. So God has to do something new and fresh by his spirit. And we see that over and over. That's why churches are always popping up. Because God's like, I can't use that anymore because it's just men got involved and now they think they're the authority there. It's not happening. I gotta go somewhere else. Jesus set the path by going outside the system of Judaism. He was crucified outside the city, Golgotha, Calvary signaling this beautiful, beautiful picture that the writer of Hebrews is showing that God was done with Judaism. He made a new covenant. It was in Jesus Christ. You know, what kind of sacrifices does God want? He wants us to be thankful. Just to say thanks. You know, here he said, as his people... We're seeking a different city. And this is important. Where where are we going? The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. And God's ways, they don't seem to make any sense to us. And sometimes they seem to be silly and maybe sometimes too easy. But the Christianity... It's not easy. It's actually very difficult. And the difficulty isn't in the ability, but in the humility. That's what makes it so hard. You know, I could make rules for Christianity that would be, you know, pray so many times a day, read so many chapters a day, and and people would buy into that. They love that. Because it's something of success, something of drive to achieve. But it's like, no, it's grace. And it's found in just being broken and humble. It was like, that's it, it's too easy. Try it. It's not that easy. Because our flesh is so proud. We always want to stand in how we're right. It's not right. It's very difficult. And when we look at our life, what are people seeking after? Stature, pleasure, security. I want to be secure. I want to have you know, financial security. I want to have, I want to be somebody. I want to live for pleasure. Those are the same things that the world lives for. So what makes you different? That's what the world wants. That's not what we're called to. We're not called to look in the things of the world. We're called to see our new home. Where is our home? It's actually a continuing city. It's in heaven. You see, we don't belong here. This is not our home. We belong with God. We're vacationing here. And with vacation, there's some great times. There's great things in life, for sure. But there's also hardships. Camping is fun sometimes. Sometimes camping is not so fun. (laughs) When you wake up in the tent, there's thousands of spiders all over you. (laughs) Not as fun. Don't say RV camping. That's not camping. (laughs) That's cheating. (laughs) But, you know, can't, the, the idea is, is that we, even though we live here in the world, and even though we can use wisdom, which we should, to have a job and to, to plan for our future and to have retirement, all those things are great. But if that is your hope, I feel bad for you. Because that's not a real hope. It's something that will be ripped from you one day. Our heart and our, and our life is to be with God one day. You know, we're going home to be with him. And we want to finish this race that Jesus Christ has put us on or put us into and that we're running this race to finish, to win. Because we're children of God. We belong with God. We are his children adopted through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
In verse 17, as we close up, it says, Obey those who rule over you, your pastor, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, because that would actually be unprofitable for you. He's saying, understand who God has called to be your pastor and teacher. And don't cause them grief because it actually be hurting yourself. You know, church, I was called to be a pastor teacher. I did not ask for this. I really didn't. I remember as a young man when I felt the calling to be a pastor, I asked my pastor, how could I know if I'm called to be a pastor or not? And he said to me, well, my pastor told me that if you could do anything else with your life, you should do that instead. I was exactly right. Because you see, as Paul would say, woe to me if I don't preach. There are some things that God, when God calls you to something, you don't get a choice in. You have to deny your own faith. And when I was younger and I felt that calling, I could not do anything else with my life. I had to go in down the road to prepare me for ministry, which eventually would lead me to be a pastor. A shepherd. My son, I asked him what he wanted to be when he grows up. Actually, I think his mom asked him. He said he wanted to be a pastor. And I told him, I said, don't ever do that. No one in the right mind would ever want to be a pastor because they have no idea what they're asking for. Even by their own statistics, it is the worst job in all the world. It is the worst. Because as Paul would say, the more that I love you, the less I am loved. It is a reality that people will never fully understand. Because love is not telling people what they want to hear. Love is found in the truth. And truth hurts people. And when people are hurt, they lash out. You see, we can understand this if you're a good parent. And when you're raising kids... What you find out is, is that you put so much effort into them because you want the best for them. And you teach them and you instruct them and you correct them. You feed them and you house them. And when they grow up, what they say to you is mean things, ungrateful words, even hateful words. And you're like, how in the world could they ever think that I don't love them? that I hate them. I give my everything for them. That is exactly what it is to be a pastor. You see, love always flows downward. You will never love God as much as he loves you or me. You can't. Your kids can never love you as much as you love them. And you guys will never love me as much as I love you. You will never understand that. Because it's just, you're not me. You don't see but there is a love of God that has been put on my heart for you guys. And just as you give your life to invest in your child, I have given my life to bring to you the word of God and truth. Now, do you regret being a parent? No, you love it. You see, that is why Paul puts this here as instruction, or excuse me, the writer of Hebrews, I do think it's Paul, but the writer of Hebrews puts it here for instruction. So you guys can see and know. If you have someone who loves you enough to share the truth with you, don't be like a little child that just complains all the time about it. Because that's a valuable thing to have. I've always said, like, do you think that I like saying what I say? The truth? I hate it at times. It's not fun. But here's the kicker. I have to give an account before the living God. And the Bible actually says that a pastor is going to be judged more severely so when I stand before God, I have to be given a higher standard of judgment than you guys. How is that fair, huh? And, and what do you think the excuse is going to be? Charlie, why don't you teach him the truth? I don't want to make him feel bad. See? I believe in God. And I believe in his word. Thus, I am required to teach it. Even if I'm hated for it. That is the reality of being a pastor. You see, guys, that's why it is wise to take a step back and see that a responsibility of a pastor 
is to care for your souls and to teach you the truth. So help him. Don't make his life harder because in helping him, you're actually helping yourself because if he is happy in a good place, he's going to be in a place that he can better invest into you instead of causing him grief. It actually says that. If you're causing him grief, it'd be unprofitable for you. It's not helping you to cause him grief. I remember when God was preparing me for the ministry. I was 24 years old. I just was married. And there was an opening for the children's ministry at our church. And I remember for three months, the, the message went out that they needed someone to run this ministry. Nobody stepped forward. Nobody. For 12 weeks, I remember this. And at the time, I was a young, ignorant kid. I wanted to just serve God. And I remember going to Pastor Jeff at the time. I said, Jeff, I'm not qualified for this. I know I'm not, but I'll do it. I don't even like kids that much, but I'll do it. I'll run it for the Lord. God changed my heart towards kids. He did. It was great. But I remember Jeff, he was at the time, was a little hesitant. He went to the board. He's like, well, hey, look, nobody else wants to do it. I started serving in the children's ministry, and I put in my life to that. It was about a year in, and, and we... We have about 70 helpers. There's a lot of kids, and we're doing VBS with big groups, I and mean, we, we had a lot going on. And I remember just investing so much time and effort into all of it, and where I didn't even have a life. But it was okay. So I was doing it for Jesus, and I remember one day I was sitting down and doing some work, and a lady in the church came up to me and says, no one likes you, Charlie. You're the reason why nobody wants to serve in the children's ministry. I was naive enough to think that Christians were all nice. And I looked at her and I started to cry at the time. And I said, I didn't really want to do this. Nobody wanted to do it. I, I just wanted to do it because I wanted to serve Jesus. If you know someone that wants to do it, or if you want to do it, please. She didn't want to do it. She just wanted to put me down. And I, thankfully my wife, she came up to me and as wives do, speak truth, and I said, she said, Charlie, you have 70 people that serve in the ministry. Don't listen to that one mean lady. Because that's how it works at times. You see, church, I know my calling. As my pastor said to me, Charlie, to be a pastor, you must be thick-skinned and you must have a soft heart because they come, because people don't like to be pricked. Just understand, I have to speak the truth because I am under an oath by the living God, by Jesus Christ himself, to teach the truth. And that is why you just go forward and knowing one day I'll be with him. As we go into communion, the exhortation today is humble yourself. We all are all sinners here. Some sins are very obvious. We see them. And some sins are secret. Nobody sees them. But they're there. And that is why David even pens in the Psalms and says, Lord, search my heart. Try me. See if there's any evil in my heart and lead me to the ways of everlasting. And there's times we just need God to reveal our, our nature to us. Not so we can be destroyed, but that we can be healed. Because the reality is, is God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. I would rather be in a place of humility and find grace than a place of making myself an error. So the worship team come up, and we're going to have communion. And as the ushers, or ushers, as the men pass out the cup, hold on to them if you're new. Just, we actually partake together as a church at the end. But I want to encourage you guys, to just let the Lord work in your heart. Let, him, let his spirit work in your heart. Because there are some things in life, or I should say the best things in life, are not things that we see. The best things in life are the things that are found in God which we don't see. And he can satisfy all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus.
My Lord, I want to just lift your church to you. And I thank you for these people here. All of us, Lord, not perfect, but saved by grace. And Lord, I just ask and pray, Lord, that you would direct our hearts and our minds, that we would be able to see, see ourselves in truth, but not that we would be destroyed, but that we would find grace. Lord, I ask and pray that you would direct, direct our steps. Fill us with your heart, Lord, your love, your joy. We want to be people after your heart, Lord. Bless us, God. Paul tells us that we, he's like, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and we are his bondservants, slaves by choice, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure in our bodies that the excellent of the power of God may be of him, not of us. So we are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We are struck down, but we're not destroyed. 
We're always caring about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus would be revealed in our bodies. For we who live are delivered to death for Jesus' sake always, that the life of Jesus would be revealed in our bodies, our mortal flesh, so then death is working in us, but life in you. Let's stand. It is the Lord that said, excuse me, Paul, that said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but yet not I. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's hold the bread before the Lord. My God, we stand here today acknowledging what you did upon that cross, that you offered your body to be broken, to be smitten for us, that it would be established, that it would be by grace, not of works. It is what you did, not what we do. And Lord, we acknowledge and understand that we are just mere people, broken. And so, Lord, we ask that you would heal us today. Bring healing to our hearts and our minds, our souls. Restore us, Jesus. We thank you that there is one who can give peace. There is one who can bring comfort. There is one who fulfills the very desire of our heart and our mind. It is you. So, God, as we proclaim your death this morning, we ask you bless this bread as we partake. Let's partake together. Let's hold the cup before the Lord. Lord, I, I don't know what word I can really say, but thank you. You offered your life. You gave your blood. You spilt your blood on that cross that we could be forgiven of all sin. Not only forgiven, but removed, exonerated by your blood, that we can stand here sinless because of you. Thank you, Lord, for that wonderful grace. And Lord, I do ask and pray that we would let go of the guilt, the condemnation, pride, sin, anything that is there, we let it go. And we would embrace this new life that you've given to us. And we would walk in the truth. So Lord, we ask you to bless this cup as we partake. Let's partake together. We'll sing um, one more song, church. Just know that uh, the Lord is for you. He loves you. He has a plan for you. And you can expect great things because he's a great God. We're going to go out in the joy of the Lord. As the scripture says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. God bless you, church. I do love you.
to you, God of peace. I rest in you, my cares release. We sing. church. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.